I spent time with both of these gentlemen in the last two years, and they are truly gentlemen. Either could be resting on his wondrous accomplishments over lifetimes of varied work, a fraction of which would be enough to satisfy most of us that we'd spent our time on Earth wisely. Instead, instead they're still crusading and wonderfully. But um, we didn't come here to hear me talk about Wes and Wendell. We came here for them to talk about one another, their work, and what sense we can all be making of agriculture and the environment. I'm going to read um, one little quote from each of them that are among my favorites. Wendell has said, and this is why people call Wendell a prophet, we have lived our lives by the assumption that what was good for us would be good for the world. We've been wrong. We must change our lives so that it will be possible to live by the contrary assumption that what is good for the world will be good for us. I think that's a pretty fundamental and quite true. Not that this is a competition and not that Wes is ever succinct, as you'll see. But Wes has said, and he said this to me directly, if your life's work can be accomplished in your lifetime, you're not thinking big enough. <laughs> You've each told me separately that you talk on the phone frequently. And without getting too personal, I'm wondering if you can share with us what you talk about and whether the conversation has been moving forward. If you're talking to somebody and the other person is your friend and you enjoy talking and you have a lot of news stories new jokes and so on to pass along and there comes along a reason to become serious then you have a serious conversation but ours is a friendly conversation which means that from the point of view of seriousness we've wasted a hell of a lot of time <laughs> but we have often had conversations that were really productive, and at the end of them, we've thanked each other. And uh, that's the way it's gone. It hasn't been intentional, deliberate, controlled by purpose, but it's been, it's been uh, under the dispensation of a kind of grace. I do detect at times that Wendell has a list uh, which is a relief because I have a list <laughs> and I can see both of us going through each of our lists sometimes uh, but there's a uh, we're working out something and uh, sometimes it's a struggle and sometimes we don't get it all taken care of in that conversation uh, but it comes up again and uh, so it's been a useful uh, conversation beyond being merely fun. All right, and it's one that continues, obviously. This is a question I get all the time, and I think of you both and wish that I could punt it over to you. And the question is, is there a sense that sustainability is becoming a fundamental issue, or is it just a bunch of us talking among ourselves? Are things getting better, or are things getting worse? A little meatier question. Well, things are getting better and things are getting worse. <laughs> I've had uh, acquaintances who answered every question with, well, yes and no. <laughs> things are getting better in the sense that this event would not have been imaginable three decades ago. Well, actually, it wouldn't have been imaginable a decade ago. Um, there are lots of places now in the country that are involved in uh, the, 
the development of local food economies and uh, the conversation about food and its obvious dependence on the land. And uh, you can go to those places and, and speak the language that Wes and I have been using and speaking with each other for, for so many years, 35. Right. And um, people know what you're talking about. You can go to some city governments and people know what you're talking about. I don't, I know you can't go to my state government and be understood. <laughs> and I don't think you can go to the Capitol in Washington and be understood. Uh, but there is a growing conversation that's using the same language, concerned about the same issues, and that's better. Things are getting worse in the sense that the corn and bean economy, for instance, uh, is a, a totally market-determined, uh, technologically limited um, a way of land use is now invading the, very, the extremely vulnerable landscapes uh, where I live. And um, we are a long way from being able to stop that. And so um, I want, to, when, when I talk to people, to, to say that we now have a beginning it's an authentic beginning, and it's not going to be undone. It's going to go on. I'm fairly confident of that. But it is a beginning. Most of the land in use now is being badly used. Yeah, I think that the so-called movement uh, follows a recipe that I think sociologists have talked about. There's the no talk, no do uh, phase. Uh, then there is the talk, no do phase. And then there's the talk, do, and eventually just do. What I th think is happening that is allowing the numbers to increase uh, in lots of places around the country is that the kind of gambles that uh, have been taken with industrialized agriculture uh, have led to some pretty serious problems in terms of nitrogen in the water, uh, dead zone, fossil fuel dependency, chemical contamination, larger and larger scale, and so on. And it seems to me that in this gamble, we're approaching the time, the industrialized system is approaching the time in which they're rolling dice that don't have any dots. There's not much there available, and therefore the stock goes up uh, for the point of view that Wendell and I have been talking about, and lots of others uh, for some time. I've been thinking of industrial agriculture as a great dragon. And uh, it's, in, it's uh, technically dead. Its little brain is destroyed. It's wrong on every count. And the list of its failures is, is um, both undeniable and immense. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico would be enough to sink it if it had a brain. So its brain is gone, but its death throes are tearing the country apart. It's thrashing about in its, in its death throes and doing a lot of damage. And a dragon, you know, is a serpent. They don't die very quickly. Um. Agriculture obviously is, is no longer an integral part of most Americans' lives. Land is something we visit, not something we work. And for the majority of us, it's not even something we live on. 
So what have we lost by that? What are we losing? And is there a way to regain it? Well, that's enormously complex because we don't even visit it. We, uh, people don't visit the land that's, that's in use. Wes talks about how people cross Kansas leaning forward this way with their eyes on the horizon. They're looking for snow-capped peaks. And uh, people visit the land that's scenic not necessarily the land that's in use. It's extraordinarily difficult to get people to be interested in land that's being used, let alone to be interested in the best ways of using it or the conservation or conversation about how best to use it. So one of the things we know is true is that the uh, the land that's in use is now understaffed. There are not enough people to use it except in the way it's being used, which is to say that most of it's being abused. So, well, one way to get at this Somebody asked me the other day what the most dangerous thing is in agriculture. I said, well, the chemicals, obviously. They're everywhere. Uh, if they stayed in place, there wouldn't be all that big a problem. But they run off. And they mix. And uh, nobody really knows what's happening. I've read some refereed, uh, peer-reviewed articles by scientists who say that the level of glyphosate in some of the Mississippi River tributaries in the Midwest is much too high. I called those people up. I said, I read what you said, and I know you know it's too high. What's the effect? And the answer always is, ha, that a lot of people would like to know because of the difficulty of connecting a cause to effect in a large volume of flowing water. It's, uh, it's very likely we're not going to know very much about that in spite of all the experts. <clears throat> but it's more complex than that. Chemicals are dangerous because they run off. Along with the runoff of chemicals goes the runoff of soil. That's one complication. Another one is that those chemicals exist to replace people. So if you reduce the chemical use, you've got to increase the use by people. And one of the daunting questions overhanging this discussion is where are the people going to come from? They'll have to be people with knowledge of how to use the land. They'll have to, know, they'll have to be people who know where they are. They'll have to be people who can uh, afford to use the land. I heard a man say, a dairyman, a very bright dairyman and a big dairyman in Kentucky, he made two points in the meeting I attended on water quality. One is the nutrients that run off are valuable. If you do the economic right thing, you're going to do the ecological right thing. That is, you're going to keep those nutrients where they belong. And then he said, later, quite a bit later, it's hard to get a farmer to think about keeping the nutrients in place if what he really has on his mind is the question of who's going to be the next person who lives in his house. So you see how these problems branch out and become complicated. And so one of the most intellectually respectable things that we can do is appreciate the complexity of the problem that we're dealing with. Is that the question you ask? <laughs> this is the answer we wanted. <laughs>